is, isn't always just is. But no matter who's in power, there's always a crisis brewing. The currency of war. The Taliban. Is this conflict is now deadlier than ever. The impact around the world will be devastating. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Join us at TN Tatum Field, July 9th to 23rd, 7 p.m. every night except Thursdays. Please visit signsofthetimesbda.org. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Then jumpstart your healing journey by joining Three Weeks to Better Health and Healing. It's a group style program on nature's powerful remedies that prevent and often reverse obesity, type two diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, poor sleep habits, low energy level, stress overload, and even early memory loss. This health program begins with pre-screening on July the 4th at Southampton Seventh-day Adventist Church Fellowship Hall from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It continues from July the 10th to July the 23rd at the tent on T.N. Tatum Field in Warwick from 6 p.m. to 6.50 p.m. nightly. Thursdays are off days. Now, this three-week program is free, but we will be providing a limited number of meals that heal at a cost based on time of registration. To register, email your name and contact number to vkwallers at gmail.com, along with a request to join Three Weeks to Better Health and Healing. I am Dr. Lena Gibbons, the main presenter for this health restoring program, and I look forward to seeing you there. Because in studying the Word of God, I can get to know my Father, and I can also have the strength and courage to face the trials that come down the road in my life. Where did we come from? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Evolution teaches the opposite. No one created. It all happened by itself. Which one is the truth? This is Headquarters. Doc M. Jackie and rich. Their job? Investigate and discover the truth. This is 
The Creation Case. Chucky? Guest talker? Hi. Uh, experimental study, they injected these um, uh, lizards with bacteria. And one group, they left them alone. And the other group, 
they gave them aspirin. So what do you think happened? The ones that got the aspirin, do you know how many of them died? Most of them died. The ones they left alone, you know what they did? What do you think those lizards do? What did they do? Give me an idea. What would the lizards do? Anybody? Come, come, tell us, tell us. What do you think the lizards did? He crawled out in the sunlight. And what happened to the temperature? It went up. And what happened to the bacteria? It was destroyed. And what happened to the lizards? They survived. So, what we often define as bad is actually good. Because the body is a powerful, you know, God has designed us in such a way of self-healing. So whenever we have a disease, we need to ask ourselves the question, what lesson is the body trying to get across? What is it trying to teach us? Okay? So the real issue is not a high blood sugar. That's the symptom. The real question is, why is it high? What's going on? And how can we correct the underlying problem? And if we do that, then what happens to the sugar? Normalizes. All right? You have high blood pressure. So you take a pill to pull it down. But the question is, why is it high in the first place? Right? Doesn't that make sense? You're in your house. Right? You have a fire alarm set up. Right? You hear this screeching sound at night. You wake up, and what do you do? Do you pull that thing out of the, out of the wall and say it's too loud? You want to get back to sleep? Huh? You run. Why? Because you understand the connection between that noise and what? Smoke and fire. So you're looking for smoke and fire when you hear that noise. Unfortunately, for many of the issues we have, what we're doing is turning off the alarm. Right? We go. Give me a pill. Give me a pill. Give me a pill, right? Let me go about my way and live my life. Just give me a pill and let, let me go on. Right? Is something wrong with that? Something's definitely wrong. So we're going to talk a little bit about diabetes, as we call it. A disease. So what is it? Um, basically, you've got too much blood sugar for too long, which creates um, serious health implications. High levels of circulating blood sugar uh, connects with certain proteins in the body, and they call, it creates what we call glycated end products or what have you. But what it actually does, it just damages the nerves, and a whole lot of other parts of our bodies that, so we don't function, function normally. So we want to fix it. So you're getting too much, too much, and if we don't correct it, it can create some problems. We should have some blood sugar, but when we have too much, it creates uh, some amazing problems. So we use some instruments. We use, um, you know, a blood sugar testing instrument, and we also do a test called a glucose tolerance test. Sometimes we'll give people like 50 grams of sugar, right? You can even do it using jelly beans, right? And what you're doing is you're taking this, this big load of sugar into the system to see how quickly your body can get rid of it, right? And if your pancreas is working really good, it can pull that sugar down quickly. If it's not working good, what's going to happen? It's going to shoot way up and it's going to stay up. And that's going to tell us, well, it's not really working that well. Okay, so there's, those are some things we can do to figure it out. So normal numbers, it depends on the labs, 70 to 99 may be considered ideal. Probably ideal is less than 80, right? You get a fasting blood sugar, 12 hours. Your blood sugar is under 100. You're good to go. You don't have any, any potential issues. Pre-diabetic, they say from 100 to 125, and diabetic, 126 and higher, 12-hour uh, fast. No food, no, nothing that gives you calories. All right, so that's, that's what we consider when we talk about this whole idea. 
Now, let me talk a little bit about this is a red blood cell. You see that on the left, and then you see on the right. And what's the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right? The one on the right has a lot more what? Looks like little balls, right? So you've got a red blood cell, and you've got attached these sugar molecules to it. Uh, when you have too many, we call that your hemoglobin A1C is elevated, right? And, and it's higher. And that creates a lot of problems for us. So normal is 4.5 to 5.6. You go to the blood, to the uh, lab, and you get your test. Some of us come up like 6 or a 7 or 8 or a 9 or a 10. Those numbers are way, way out of, out of, out of order, right? You want it closer to um, under 6. You want it under 6, and that's that number. And it gives you an idea of how well the sugars have been going for the last three months. All right, so that's that. Optimal is under 5. Your blood sugar is actually at about a 97 if your, if your hemoglobin A1C is 5. So uh, diabetes 6.5, okay? All right, so um, if it's 12, that means your average blood sugar is 298. All right, and that's, that's not a good number. And all the way down to 5, which is 97, and that's what we want to have. The good news, every 1% reduction in this hemoglobin A1C, you can see the nerve damage decreased by 37%, risk of amputation by 43%, heart attacks by 14 and diabetes-related deaths. Just by one point decrease. So it's important to know something about it. Of course, older people, overweight, you don't exercise, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history, or African-American or Bermudian. Uh, these are, and some warning signs, uh, excess thirst, excess urinated, urination, excess appetite. Most people don't know complications, your eye problems, uh, you can go blind, you can get kidney failure, you can have a heart attack, you can have a stroke. And all that is because too much sugar is circulating in your bloodstream. So two to four times, dementia is a problem, believe it or not. Uh, if you have high blood sugar, you're more likely to end up with Alzheimer's. Did you know that? No. If you have high cholesterol, you're more likely to come down with Alzheimer's. If you have high blood pressure, if your weight is extremely high, all of those are risk factors associated with becoming, you know, having Alzheimer's. And when most people think of Alzheimer's, we don't think, we think, well, well, there's nothing we can do, right? We just, just do what we can to help them. But there are things that we are doing and lifestyle factors that are actually contributing to that. So uh, infections, amputation, and cancers are much higher. The higher your blood sugar, the more likely the cancer, if you have it, it will get worse. So blood sugar is not something you need to uh, uh, think of as something that's not really of, of concern. 90% uh, of all uh, diabetics are type two. That means the body actually produces enough of its own insulin, but it's not working well. And the reason it's not working well, it has a lot to do with our lifestyle. So there is uh, insulin-dependent diabetes where you require insulin because the beta cells of the pancreas no longer produce it. And insulin is the, is the key that knocks on the door of the cell and say, open up, there's a lot of sugar in here, you know, it needs to go into the cell, right? And the cell will, may say, no, we've got everything we need, and we're not letting anything get in here, right? And that's what happens when you've got plenty of insulin. So that it's knocking on the door, but the cell's not letting it in. And there's a reason why. And what, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right. So glucose is the fuel, and insulin is the key to unlock the door so that the sugar gets out of your bloodstream into your cells. And you need that sugar to survive, right? So let's talk about um, resistance. And we're going to talk about the Pima Indians. Uh, these 
These Indians live in Mexico. That's where they originated from. And believe it or not, back in the old, you know, the Pima Indians in Mexico, they don't have the problems of the Pima Indians that live in Arizona, you know. They're, they're the same genetic cousins, but one group, most of them end up with diabetes and the others next to none. So my question is, why is it that the Indians that live in Arizona get diabetes and the Indians that live in the old land don't get it? Anybody want to come to the mic and tell us, why is it that these, these, these Indians that live in Arizona under so-called so American rule, right? Getting American food, right? <laughs> so lifestyle. tell us. Lifestyle. Lifestyle. So what do you think about the Indians? Don't go, don't go down. No, 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 no. You got up there? Okay, so tell, give me some ideas. What is it like in your thinking, the Indians that live back in Mexico compared to the Indians that live in Arizona? Why do you think, just, just think. The ones in Mexico are inclined more to eat natural foods. Okay. As opposed to the ones in Arizona, which will eat more fast food. All right. Oh, tell, tell, me, tell, me, uh, tell me something about activity. What do you think? Yes. And um, they, the ones in Mexico, they're going to get more exercise as opposed to the ones in Arizona. All right. You're going to be driving a car in Arizona. Yes. You're going to do less walking. You can. Whereas the ones in Mexico, much mm -hmm. more walking. Okay. All they, right. Thank you. Thank they you. Aren't much as, they, the ones in Mexico aren't as affluent as the ones in, in um, Arizona. All right. Living in all that. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and let's take a look at that. And um, some researchers actually did. Uh, study to look at that. Let's see if we can advance. I don't know. That's good. All right. So, the, uh, diabetes is 6.4% globally, 9% in the U.S., 12 to 13% in Bermuda, and 38% in Pima Indians. Isn't that something? But they had their cousins, and their cousins live in Mexico, and they're about 5 to 8% versus 34 to 40% in America. Now, let's look at why they're different. On average, you can see the males are 140 uh, pounds versus 215 difference. Female, 138, 200. Obesity, 6%, 63%. Uh, fat intake, less than 25. Low fat versus high fat. So that's the difference in the diets of these genetic cousins. Physical activity, 22 hours a week versus three hours a week. Now, how, what, what could they possibly be doing 22 hours a day? But they have to go uh, down to the river, find their water, put it in buckets, and carry it up. They get a bath, they gotta go down to the river. Then they got to grow everything they eat and then eat everything they grow. In America, they're driving around in tractors and they're eating all this packaged food that they got from the Americans. Fiber intake, over 50 grams of fiber a day versus less than 20. Now, most people in affluent societies don't eat a lot of fiber, right? We eat only... White, red, white bread, white rice, everything is, you know, highly processed. And you know why we eat all that processed stuff? Because it feels good going down, right? It just melts in your mouth. You ever eat this, this, this things, uh, croissants or what have you, you know? And once you, once you bite into it, it just melts away. But if you eat that real whole grain, what do you got to do? You got to chew it. And chew it. <laughs> but that other stuff, man, just a few bites, you swallow it, and it, it creates this mouthfeel that's very pleasurable. And you just want to have more and more of it. So 
What's the diet in Mexico? Lots of what? Beans and potatoes and corn and garlic and peppers and peaches and apples. Uh, 70 80% of the diet is carbohydrates. Fats are only up to 12%. Protein is 12 to 14. So low protein, right? High carbohydrate, right? Healthy people. And when you go to America, they live on subsidized U.S. food. The food includes white flour, sugar, lots of lard, and corn canned goods. And you wonder why uh, they have the highest rates of diabetes in the world. So the real issue is not what we call diabetes, but what? The lifestyle that was created. All right. Now, this is, this is an interesting look at how much fiber people have and their risk of diabetes. And you can see here, um, low fiber, high risk, high fiber what? Low risk. And the highest is 60 grams of fiber. Now, what does 60 grams of fiber look like? Well, one cup of, of beans is about nine grams of fiber. So 60 grams is a lot of fiber. And if you were getting in 60 grams of fiber, you have no problems going to the bathroom. Absolutely none. In fact, you'd have no problems with weight. And you know why you wouldn't have any problems with weight? Because all that fiber, right, is going to expand, and you're going to stop eating before you get too, too much. It's going to take a while for that fiber to get through your system, so you're not going to feel like snacking once you eat a meal three hours, four hours, five hours before you feel hungry again. If you're eating all that non-fiber food, oh yeah, you feel hungry real quick, right? So it's getting back to those whole foods. So the more fiber you eat, the lower your risk of uh, becoming um, diabetic. So... Uh, get the fiber up, and the blood sugar will plummet. Actually, this is also true for heart disease and breast cancer and diabetes. All three, as the fiber gets higher and higher, all the health problems get lower and lower until they simply vanish away. So here are some top 20 high-fiber foods. So at the top, you've got passion fruit which is one of the highest in fiber. You've got navy beans, white beans, uh, buckwheat, lentils, figs, extremely high in fiber, black, black beans, lima beans, peas, oat bran. So these are all examples of foods that are amazingly high in fiber. And let me give you one example. Uh, a patient came to my office. She was taking uh, 40 units of insulin. She was going to the diabetic center. She was seeing the specialist, you know, and her sugars were what? <laughs> Through the roof. So I said, okay, let's try something for one week. And guess what? I said, let's, let's, this is the winter time, so I, so I, so I want you to eat soups, all right? And, and lots, of, lots of beans and all this stuff, right? All right, and within one week, her blood uh, insulin levels were, were cut in half. Her blood sugar levels dropped significantly, and she lost about 10 pounds. And she was feeling better uh, just by making these simple, simple yet effective changes. Okay, the best beans for blood sugar control are chickpeas, pinto beans, and black beans, based on the research. So... If, you, if your, your blood sugar is out of control, have a half, a half to a half a cup of beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that one thing would help to bring it down. Doesn't seem to be working. Go up to what? A cup. And if you eat a cup of beans, how much space are you going to have left <laughs> to eat a lot of other things? You see, if you would displace room for those things that don't have fiber... And the fiber will bind the cholesterol and help to control your blood sugar levels. All right, here are some other things. Uh, acorn squash is, is high in fiber. Uh, avocados, guava, flax seeds, blackberries, 
raspberries, and bulgur wheat. Uh, it's actually several different types of wheats. They sort of crack it, and they cook it in a certain way. And so these are the top high-fiber foods. So if you've got sugar problems, you know, take a whole of these. If you've got weight problems, take a whole of these. You know, use these things to good advantage. Um, we're going to go beyond that. Now, there was a study that compared two diets, um, the vegan diet and the uh, standard uh, ADA diet. And this is what they gave them, beans, lentils, peas, leafy greens, almost all fruit. They didn't give them watermelon or pineapple, bargo wheat, pompernacle bear, yam, sweet potatoes, brand cereal, oatmeal, no calorie restrictions. You can eat as much as you want. What do you think happened? Did they gain weight? Did they lose weight? Did the blood sugars go up or did the blood sugars come down? Let's see what happened. Uh, oh, there was another diet, the American Diabetic Association diet. So they cut back on sugars and starches. So... Um, <clears throat> Potatoes, etc. Uh, lower in cholesterol and reduce calorie if they were overweight. So if you were overweight, you were told that you need to reduce how much what? Your calories. In the other group, you were not to reduce any calories. All you were to do eat is to eat those foods. Are you with me? Can you eat all you want of a certain type of food and still lose weight and get blood sugar control as a result of that, right? So that, that was the question. And what about those who restricted their calories? You know, you put them on a low-calorie diet if they're overweight. What was the result of that plan compared with the other plan? And here you have it. Uh, those on the plants lost 14.3 14 14 pounds. The ADA diet, 6.8. What a difference, right? Twice the amount. Um, hemoglobin A1C went down 1.3 plus versus 0.38. Bare cholesterol 21 versus 10. Uh, reduced medication, 43% uh, of the patient versus 21% oh, percent of the patients. Compliance, more were compliant on the unrestricted plant diet than the restricted um, all types of food diet. Isn't that amazing? Weimar Institute is one of the living centers like I went to many years ago. I went to a place called Yuchi Pines. And um, what inspired me about there was to see a lot of people who, who came with a, you know, a bag full of pills, feeling like they're on their last and leaving in three weeks like you know, they had regained life and limb, you know, getting off most of all of their medications and um, feeling like they were Amazing. So 50% of all type 2 diabetics were off all medications and insulin in 21 days. Can you imagine that? People who are on medication for 20 years come to a place and in 21 days they got off all of them? How could that possibly be? It's something about changing the way we live. The real solution is not an appeal but in how we live. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, nerve pain, neuropathy, is one of the side effects of high blood sugar over a long period of time. 80% uh, were pain-free in 17 days, and that's unheard of. But the power of a lifestyle, Lifestyle Centers of America, another type of facility just like that, and uh, you can see 14 of, of type 2 diabetics in this particular, 82%, were off insulin at the end of 19 days. In another center uh, by Gabrielle Cousins, MD, 100% got off all medication. Blood sugar became normal in 61% of them. All right, high fiber, 16-day program. 21 diabetics were on 20 units of insulin for up to how many years? 20 years. They put them on a what diet? A high-fiber diet. Okay? Plant-based diet. 
for 16 days, and they were all in a metabo metabolic ward. That means they were all, you know, locked in a building, right, where all their food was prepared for them, and they all were on, you know, high levels of insulin. And what happened as a result of that in 16 days? Insulin requirements dropped by 60%, and 10 of the patients got off all their insulin in only 16 days. Cholesterol went from 206 to 147 in uh, only how many days? Six days. Now, typically, um, if you get layup work, you know how frequently they will give you another layup work? Three months, right? But you can see results in as short as 16 days. Total uh, transformation. Amazing. And you can see the average change uh, in body weight and insulin amounts in eight men. You can see it decreasing going over as a result. So diet low in saturated fat, uh, high in fiber, uh, normalizes blood sugar when a diet low in fiber and high in processed foods actually increases, reduces insulin sensitivity. So what are back basically saying is, even though your body has all the insulin it needs, it can't work because of the type of diet people are eating. So the insulin's knocking on the door and the cell saying, no, too much fat in here already. Uh, we got all the energy we need, so your, your numbers just keep rising. If you get the fat out of the cells, what happens? The, ins the insulin works, and the body is able to capture that and to give you those, those benefits. 46% of di diabetes cured at one year in this particular study, uh, looking at um, uh, blood pressure medication as a result of changing their diets. And you can see the more weight people lost, the higher the percentage of individuals that were off all diabetic medications. So the more weight you have, the harder it is for the body to uh, maintain proper control. And this is uh, an example of a diet that was very effective. Lots of salads, uh, lots of beans, uh, fruit, uh, nuts and seeds, and lots of steamed greens and vegetables. Very effective uh, in um, normalizing blood sugar, and we talked about this earlier. All right, so exercise could prevent 30 to 50% of all new cases of diabetics, diabetes. That was a harvest study. So if you're getting enough exercise, it will work. Inactive muscle cells start working. They become more sensitive to insulin, increasing the uptake of sugar. So aerobic and resistance, variety, interval training, that means you start out, you're going intense, and then you slow down, and then you go up again, you come down, you go up. This up and down, up and down fashion, you actually burn more calories than if you're staying at one pace. Think of a, think of a car in a city, you're, you're slowing down, right? But you, on a highway, you burn less gas, right? You're at a constant rate. So if you want to burn more calories, go up and down, up and down, up and down and that you will burn more calories. That's more natural. Um, all right, a digestive walk after a meal for 15 to 30 minutes will actually lower your sugars even more. So you eat and then you take a night relaxing walk and your sugars will, will not rise as high as they would had you not did anything. Of course, continuous breasts, large muscle groups, promote circulation, Increased breathing rate, brisk walking, jogging, cycling, rowing. These are all very important. Resistance is also important. And uh, 150 minutes, 25 minutes a day, six days a week, can decrease hemoglobin A1C by 0.89. All right. So that's a little bit about exercise. 10-minute walk after uh, dinner, drop blood glucose spikes by 22%. So you can see that 
Each minute of post-exercise reduces the blood sugar by two milligrams. Just two, two milligrams for each minute. So if you're walking for 15 minutes, that's going to be 30, um, 30 milligram drop in blood sugar. So this is important uh, about exercise and its role. Um, water, sitting in a sauna, actually can lower, uh, a whirlpool top can actually lower your blood sugar. Uh, anything that increases sweating or perspiration actually is going to increase the burning of uh, excess calories. Uh, an average drop in blood sugar, 23 milligrams. Uh, patients that were in a, in a sauna, infrared sauna, uh, their sleep and well-being. So all of these benefits. What about water? Two cups of water before the main meal. Uh, that was related to weight loss. And when, as you lose weight, your blood sugar, tend, you tend to have better control. All right. Sunlight uh, improves sleep, reduces mood. I mean, improves mood, uh, it helps with pain, and people who are highly stressed have higher uh, blood sugar levels. If you don't sleep, your sugars run higher. If you're under a lot of stress, your sugars are running higher. So stress, insufficient sleep, not enough exercise, not the, not, uh, not the right types of foods, all of that can affect your blood sugar levels. So... Let's get to some whole healthy food rather than this food that blows you up but doesn't really help to control blood sugar. Uh, ex breathing, deep breathing and sleeping, all of these are factors that are important in blood sugar control. Stress activates cortisol level, which causes a release in sugar, which increases insulin levels, increases sugar and all of that provides uh, not the right uh, environment. So, of course, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your what? And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall what? Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Anybody have a question? Blood sugar. And come to the mic at this time, and you ask your question, and we'll we'll see what we can do to uh, share some share some thoughts, some insights on what you can do to uh, help your body do its best. Doctor Lana, yes, um, it's not about diabetes, but it's more about I know a little bit about posture. Yes, and I was thinking like. For the loo, you know what the loo is. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the posture on the loo is sitting forward or sitting back, which way would have your stomach. You mean fully. to 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 uh, enhance the um, expulsion of uh, fecal matter. Okay. okay yeah. <laughs> so there are cultures, right, where they have a hole or something in the ground, right, and they do what? They squat, right? And then you're in the squatting position. Do you know it's easier to go? So if you're straining and you could put your feet on a stool to, to put you in sort of a squatting position, you would be easier for you to use the bathroom. Isn't that amazing? That, that God designed us to, 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 to go down like this. And when you're squatting, you can, you can defecate uh, much easier. Okay. Anybody else? Who's next? This is your time. Come on. Come one. It's free. Nobody's going to bite you. Nobody's going to look at you in any, any you know, what, what you're doing going up there. Hi. Come on over. Give us a question. Okay. Let me say a little bit about exercise. Exercise is good for longevity, right? So for every hour you exercise, oh, we got a question. Yes. I, I don't sleep very good at night. What can I do about that? Oh, you don't sleep. Okay, we can take up all our time here. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about sleep. 
What you do in the day sets you up for how you sleep at night. What you do at night sets you up for how you live during the day. So if you're engaged in a lot of physical activity during the day, you know what that does? It sets you up for sleeping at night. There are hormones, there are chemicals, there's a whole lot going on. But the more active you are during the day, the more likely you're going to what? Sleep at night. So activity is an important thing. Now, there are some things that, that deter us from sleeping. There's alcohol, there's caffeine, and there's nicotine. And all of them suppress your ability to sleep. So stimulants, caffeine, and all of those things, they may pick you up, but they suppress your body's ability to produce a chemical we call melatonin. And melatonin is essential for sleeping and longevity and fight against viruses and a whole lot of other things. All right? So you want to have a sleep routine. So you're gearing down to sleep. So you, you, you had to put on relaxing music, right? So your body gets the idea that it's time to what? If all you do is when you go to your bed, you turn on the TV, right? And you start looking at your devices. What does your body assume? It's time for what? To time to get engaged. So it becomes alive. And you know, you know? And some people say, this is, the, this is the best time that I can learn and study and all of that. But what it's doing is preventing you from actually sleeping. So you want to do things that calm down and relax, you know, deep breathing exercise, a lot of exercise. And then you've got herbs like valerian and, and hops, right, and passion flower. All of them have a, a, a relaxing effect. Sitting in a tub with, with warm water, you know, nice warm, and you want to sleep in a room that is what? That is quiet, that is dark, that is well ventilated, right? And, and that will help in production of melatonin to help you sleep. So those are a couple of things that may be helpful. Yes? Good evening, how are you? Good evening, how are you? Um, my question is, is there a natural alternative for warfarin? Warfarin. Warfarin is uh, uh, used as, uh, you know, involved with blood thinning and all of that. Um, garlic is good for blood thinning. Um, actually, um, tomatoes were compared with aspirin, and it helps to prevent that, that clotting. There's an herb. I'm, I'm not telling you to do I'm this in place of I'm telling you things that actually uh, have a blood. I'm uh, allergic to tomatoes. You're allergic to tomatoes. There is a plant called amla. Amla is an Indian gooseberry. And it actually helps to thin the blood. It actually helps to lower cholesterol. Uh, it's, a, it's not a sweet berry. They do sell it at, as, a, as a powder. It may call it like amlaka, A-M-L-A-K-A. -A -A. So you will find it at, at Indian markets or, or some of our Asian markets would have amla powder. And it has a very good uh, blood thinning effect. Uh, they compared it with, with, with aspirin and other blood thinners. Uh, it doesn't cause bleeding, excess bleeding or any of that, but it helps to prevent the, the blood from uh, excessively clotting. Okay, those are natural things. I'm not telling you to go and do this and stop taking your warfarin. All right, you need to, to, to be under advisement of your, of your doctor. Uh, he may not know about it, and he may say it, 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 it is not going to work or anything like that. But I'm telling you, right, uh, God has given us amazing plants that are able to do some amazing things if we would just trust him and apply those things. Okay. All right? Thank you. Um, so there are a number of, you know, I even have, I have a handout that, looks at a whole list of foods that help to keep the blood from clotting, how much to take and all of that. So if you want to connect with me uh, to get that, you can do that. Yes? 
Good evening again. I heard yes. what you said about sleep, but I don't know if it's called posture when you are trying to go sleep. Like if you're on your two sides, your back or your stomach. Yeah. And your back or your stomach. But which one is, is best to start your sleep off with? Because it's uncontrollable once you do get sleep. Yeah, like I mean, in turn, but I couldn't answer I, that. I feel comfortable because right. I'm, I'm a little overweight. Yeah. So I normally toss from side to side. Yeah. We all toss from side to side. We all move. We, we're constantly moving, right? Because if you stay in the same place all the time, right, you end up with ulcers, right? And that's why people who are, you know, bedridden, they can't move. They're staying in one place, so they're getting that pressure. And so what's happening? You're not getting circulation. You're not getting blood. And so what happens to the tissue? The tissue dies. It starts to degenerate, right? So they keep turning the patients, right? But there's something you can put on it if you started to see a little something. And what is that? Anybody know? You can get it at any marketplace. You can get it at the ABC. And it's a powerful healer for all sorts of ulcers, even ulcers down to the burn. And it works better than the drugs. What is it? No. Come on, somebody, somebody. Anybody want to guess? It's actually sweet. It's honey. Honey is amazing. You can put it on a gauze and you can put it on an area and the honey will speed up the healing. If you have like dandruff and stuff in your hair, right? You take 80% honey, 20% water, mix it up, right? And then put it in your hair for like a couple of hours, right? Then rinse it out, right? And that will help clear up stuff you got in your scalp. Isn't that amazing? We, we serve amazing God. And uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Who has another question? Come. This is your time. I started out talking about exercise. If you walk a mile, walk an hour, how much life expectancy will you increase for every hour you move? Who wants to guess? For every hour you move, you live an additional two to three hours. Okay? So if you don't move, what are you doing? You're accelerating your demise. So think about it. <laughs> I, I, to I talked about a gentleman who lived in his 90s, right? Um, some, year, some nights ago. All of his friends died at, in their 40s. But he walked about 20 to 30 to 40 miles every day. Can you believe that? No, he walked for money. That was his job. People said, listen, if you could walk from this distance to that distance in, in a certain period of time, I'll give you like $5,000, right? And people always challenged it. And he would walk across the country, back and forth and back and forth. And he died, and every, he, he died because he got an accident, a car hit him, and he never recovered from him, but he was in his 90s. But everybody else had died half his age. So that's an encouragement to us to get moving, to keep walking. And so diabetes uh, is, is preventable. You can arrest it. You can reverse it by following some simple, uh, amazing uh, lifestyle principle. So I want to encourage you to, to get out and move and don't believe the sentence that they have given you. That there's nothing you can do, right? God can do all things. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Uh, bless us as we uh, continue to apply these principles. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, and if anyone uh, didn't get your meals, see me. They are frozen. What's left? Take care.
and strength on every hand and violence fills our lands still some people doubt that he would come again but the word of God is true Jesus will return. Signs of the times are everywhere. There's a Yes, uh, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. Before I give you the official welcome this evening, I'd like just to share with you two, two things, two colors I have here. Uh, the first one in, in my hand, I have, um, I have blue and blue. That's just, just in case you know, if you know, yes, I, have, I have blue and blue. All right, all right, oh, I hear, I hear, I hear. All right, and then, and then I have the next ribbons, I have, I have red and blue, red and blue. Oh, mercy, red and blue, red and blue. Oh, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. Hey, but, but check this out. Don't get too excited. Don't get too excited. Because I, I, I'm not here this evening to welcome the St. George's Cup match fans. I, I'm not here to, to welcome the Somerset Cup match fans. I, I'm here to welcome the fans of Jesus Christ. Woo! 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 Now, no, you see, before I, I go on, Jesus Christ was the only player that could bat up that could bow and feel all at the same time. 
<laughs> well, go get I'm talking to him, I'm talking to somebody. Now, look, look at this here. He's the only one that's still at the wicked, meaning that it's not out. Woo, I want you to catch that. So, so this evening, on behalf of Pastor Dijon To and the Southampton Church family, we would like to welcome you once again to another night of the Signs of the Times series. And also, I'd like to also welcome again our, our brothers and sisters from the sister churches, from Summers Seventh Adventist Church to Restoration Seventh Adventist Church, from Warwick Seventh Adventist Church, Devonshire, Pembroke, and Hamilton, also Midland Heights, and even St. George's and St. David's. We would like to welcome them too. We thank you for your support. And also, I'd like to thank all of those that have joined us throughout this week that are online through the different social media platforms that we are using and that's being made available. We'd like to welcome you once again, but also I, I do apologize and overlook. It's a group that I have not mentioned, but I've been informed that they're tuning in too. I would like to thank all the youth and the young people that are joining in too. I'm just to let you know that we haven't forgotten you, and I'm letting you know that Pastor Todd and Southampton Church loves you too. And so this evening, we are welcoming all the youth and the young people that are joining in on this this um, Science of the Time series through the different platforms that are being made available because we know that the young people are very tacky and we are giving them the opportunity to join us if they don't want to join us in person. So as, we, as I close up once again, I just remind you, I'm not, I didn't come out to welcome the St. George's fans or the Somerset fans. I came and stood here this evening to welcome all the fans of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this evening, I pray that you'll be blessed and have a wonderful evening once again. Amen. Thank you. How many of you know that in order for us to understand the signs of the times, we really need to put our trust in him? Right. I remember a, a song back in the day that my um, mom and dad, no, my grandmother taught me. It was in the Christian song, but it's in the hymnal too. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. One of my favorite hymns says, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the said the Lord. And we just cry, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust in him and how I proved him over and over, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. For those of you who've never heard this song, the, the verses in this song is so amazing for you to read for yourself, learn for yourself, because you're going to hear some words tonight from the pastor that you might not have heard before, whether you're in this space or online. But I want you to ever be reminded that he is absolutely trustworthy. You may not trust your boss, may not trust your family members, you may not even trust the person next to you, but I'm telling you that it is sweet, sweet to trust him more. The second verse says, oh, 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 how sweet to trust in Jesus, trust to trust 
his cleansing blood. I just from simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing blood. My last verse. I'm so glad that I have learned to trust in him, precious Jesus, Savior and friend. And I know that he will be with me. Jesus, oh, how I trust in him and I proved him over and over, over, Jesus, 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 precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more oh for grace to trust him more oh for grace to trust him only trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you trust him. Only trust him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What a blessed Lord and Savior we serve. As I was sitting over there just listening to the song, I happened to look over to my, I guess I can't say my left or my right because left will be there, right will be there. So I looked straight ahead and I noticed the young lady on the drums. Let's give her a hearty amen. That's sweet, sweet. You know, I always wanted to play the drums. Um, when I was away in school, you know, they say, they asked, what instrument do you like to play? And I put down the drums, but somehow I found myself on the trumpet. So only the guys could play the drums. So, but that's sweet. Cool. God is good. Worthy to be praised. Now, you know, all this talk about cup match. Well, you know what? I thought about something. Tonight, for the visitors, I have all the St. George's visitors tonight. Give them a gift. How that song? And tomorrow night, I'll do Somerset. How that song? Oh, don't I know? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> I know or not, but I'm a St. George's fan. <laughs> But God is good. God is good. Everyone had a beautiful day? Praise the Lord. Had some good weather, nice breeze, sunshine, and rain was earlier, cooled the earth down, made it nice for tonight so that you could sit off, get this breeze blowing through, so you could say hallelujah, praise the Lord, and amen. Well, I've got some good gifts here for you tonight, and I'm going to start in this corner because last night, I believe the gentleman, it was two of them that stood up, so I'm going to have the visitor that was here last night that stood up that I wasn't able to give a gift if it's over there tonight I'm not sure but yes he is so I'm just gonna yes so you how they say you come on down <laughs> and you are our first contestant <laughs> and you could just introduce yourself for me please Carlton Johnson 
Somerset. <laughs> go bless, go bless. All right, I messed up. I messed up, man. I picked up a Somerset fan. Oh, wow. <laughs> but God is so good. Now, I'm going to go to the far left of the tent. Are there any visitors to my far left? Any visitors? <laughs> no, we don't have any. If we do, you gotta come forward. Okay, not no one. Okay, that's all right. That's cool. All right, so I'm gonna go down the middle here. You just call me. All right, okay. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> come on, hearty, amen. That's just coming. Praise the Lord. All right. You know, it's not too often you're coming down the front, getting that clap. Everybody's looking at you, smiling, feeling good on a nice evening. What is your name? Uh, Pamela Minus. Pamela Minus. It's nice to see you, and thank you for coming on down, and this is your voucher. See, now you're supposed to come hustling real bad. St. George's, St. George's, St. George's. <laughs> So what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying, yes. But they say, drum roll, please. <laughs> so I have one left. One left. Now, if you're with me on this, you're going to move fast. Who is our next person? Right in this section. Our visitor in this section. This section right here. We don't have any in this section. Okay. What about this section right here? Do we have any visitors? I know, I know. But remember now, I'm taking each section, so I got that one first. So I'm just checking the other sections, and then I'll move back over. No one in this section? But you, you come on down. You come on down. Come on down. So... What I, what I, oh, you were, you were standing? I'm so sorry. I did, I, I didn't, you know, I honestly didn't even see you. I saw the young man, but I didn't see you. But that's okay. Both of you come on down. Both of you. Because we're not going to have a repeat. <laughs> oh, ain't what that down before. We are not going to have that repeat. You know, you have to learn from things that don't go right. And if you fail to learn, well, then, hey, it's coming back again. All right. Come closer. I promise I don't bite. <laughs> All right. Just introduce yourself. Rhonda Pitts and George's. See? What are they? Yes. There you go. My pleasure. Come on, man. Come on down. And what the gift's coming around. Okay? I'm not going to have you come out front and slide you. <laughs> All right. And just let us know where you're from. I'm Richie Phil from Philippines. All right. Do you have a team? Do you have a, a cricket team? That's all right. Just say St. George's. Okay. George's. Don't I give, don't I give you no gift. Don't, no, no. St. George's. St. George's. 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 Hey, hey. Touch me, right? Touch me. We can bring the gift later on, okay? Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hey, some sister, stop trying to steal our people. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to leave you with this thought. Okay, now listen to this. Respect the old when you are young. Help the weak when you are strong. Confess the foe when you are wrong because one day in life you will be old, weak, and wrong. Praise the Lord. Amen. Be old, weak, and what was that word? And wrong. <laughs> I tell you, you got to write a book. Donna says, I think that's a good title. Will you stand with me now as we sing our theme song and get ready to hear the word of God, powerfully brought to us by our evangelist, Pastor Tull.
years of time have come and gone. Years of time have come and gone since I first heard it told how Jesus will come again someday. If back then, back then, it seems so real, then I just can't help but feel how much closer, and it is close, how much closer is coming is today come on if you believe it ring it outside are everywhere and there's and there's a brand new feeling in the air keep your eyes upon the My wars and strife are on every hand. And violence. And it fills our land. Still some people doubt. They doubt that he is coming again. But the word of God is true. The word of God is true. He'll redeem his children. So don't lose hope. Oh, hold on. Know that Christ Jesus will descend. Oh, signs of the times are everywhere. Oh, and there's a brand, brand new feeling in the may be seated. Amen, amen, amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening, and happy Wednesday to each and every one of you. Amen. Looks like we're having a good old time in this place. God is blessed, amen. Still getting that nice, cool breeze. I don't see too much fanning, but if the fanning, it may be from the flies. But we praise God for just giving us good weather thus far in these meetings. Amen. Uh, I would just like to, of course, welcome everyone back to uh, this, our fifth night, our fifth night. And I just would like to just remind everyone, just remind everyone, uh, will there be a meeting tomorrow night? There will be no meeting tomorrow night. So uh, you have an opportunity to... Uh, get a little break, get some rest, get prepared uh, for what will be a power-packed weekend. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so uh, we will continue after tonight. We will meet uh, tomorrow on Friday night. On Friday night, on Friday night, we will uh, uh, continue on. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, weekend plan uh, for you. I would just like to mention very quickly that those who are, of course, watching uh, by way of online, I want to remind you of our website. Uh, you can go to www.signsofthetimesbda.org, <laughs> uh, signsofthetimesbda.org, and you have an opportunity to uh, join us in uh, filling out these wonderful study guides. Uh, how many of you have had an opportunity to just go back and just reflect on the study guides? As I said, there's some things I... Uh, because of time, I'm unable to cover, but you can see some added uh, little trinkets there in the study guides to help you in your study. And so I pray that you uh, use these to your benefit. Uh, but you can also fill these study guides out online for those who are online. And of course, those who are visitors, uh, you probably received a wonderful, a nice binder that looks something like this. It looks something like this. These are for our visitors because we would like for everyone to have one, but because we have a limited amount, we are able to, only able to give it to our visitors. 
Uh, but maybe next time we do something like this, we'll make sure we have enough for everyone. And so we just want to uh, remind you, you can uh, also, when you come back on Friday, it's how many of you are enjoying the supper, the light supper? Is the supper good? 5.30 to 6.30, amen? I want to thank uh, our team there and providing a meal so that everyone, uh, you're coming straight from work, you have an opportunity to just uh, get here and enjoy yourself. Uh, and You don't have to worry about saying, I'm going to uh, eat late. I don't know if you heard Dr. Gibbons. I don't know if it's, if it's talked about that late night eating, uh, but, uh, but you can have an early meal and so that you don't have to be hungry when you get home. And so uh, I pray that you will enjoy the opportunity to uh, have access to uh, all the materials that we have. Uh, there are a number of resources and magazines and added information as you come night after night. So what's going to happen is uh, tonight our message is Mark Safe. On Friday night, on Friday night, when you come on Friday night, we're going to look at a very important topic is the anatomy of evil. And I would like for you to just please pray even in your time off. You have an opportunity to uh, catch up for those who uh, may have missed a number of sermons. But even remember Friday night in prayer, we're going to expose the enemy. Amen. And so we know when that usually happens, the enemy likes to make a lot of noise. And so we just want to invite you to pray in preparation for uh, Friday night. You don't want to miss. And then, of course, on Saturday morning, uh, we have a message. Does worship really matter? You're not going to want to miss this. Does worship really matter? I walk around, and many have uh, so many questions in reference to this topic. We're going to see what the Bible says in reference to, does worship really matter? What does the Bible say? You don't want to hear what I have to say. You don't want to hear what uh, any uh, human being has to say. What does God have to say about this topic? And that's what we will learn on Saturday morning as we continue to transition in our messages. And then we'll look at a message on Saturday night. On Saturday night, uh, the sign that you are safe. The sign that you are safe. And then on Sunday, on Sunday, uh, we're going to take a look at close, close. Uh, I know when you look at the handbill, you probably saw that it said closed on the handbill. The title is closed. We will be open on Sunday. The title is closed, all right? The title is closed. So we will be here on Sunday night, uh, even though the message is titled closed, all right? So we will be here on Sunday night. Uh, so uh, please, uh, we look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Father God, again, we ask that you would please uh, speak so that we can hear your voice clearly. Thank you for, uh, Lord God, your people who have showed up today. Everyone here, Lord God, you love this world and you have, Lord God, sent your son, Lord God, so that all may have life and escape that. And so we thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago, that all who accept this wonderful free gift can be secured in their salvation with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, of course, uh, last night we uh, took a look at our message, Judgment Day. We are going to uh, do just a fair bit of last uh, night's presentation and review because it's really, really important. Uh, it's foundational and we'd like everyone to have an opportunity to catch up. Uh, but as I considered this message, I... Uh, how many of you are familiar with the uh, uh, Facebook safety chat? Uh, if it's a storm in the area, usually when it takes place in the United States of America, and individuals in their territory, they, uh, you know, it may have been a hurricane or some type of storm or some type of fire, and then they ask, uh, Facebook has this icon and it says, just mark yourself safe. Have you seen that before? Mark yourself safe. Uh, that's what I want to talked about this feature is activated by the company during uh, natural or man-made disasters and terror-related incidents to quickly determine whether people in the affected ge geographical area are safe, are safe. Last evening, uh, we took a look at Judgment Day, and it has become, uh, for some, when they hear that topic, pretty uncomfortable. But hopefully after yesterday's message, that has changed. Amen. Many people give up because they are afraid of the judgment. But we saw last night 
is that judgment is actually good news. It's good news. And so I want to ask the question, who wants to mark themselves safe during judgment day? You want to mark yourself safe during judgment day. The world, I can assure you, is in a crisis. And something is, as we've learned, is happening in heaven. You can be confident and begin to mark yourself safe when you believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. We saw last night through Revelation 14, the first angel of the world will discover at some moment, just before Jesus returns, that the judgment is already underway. Did we see that last night? The books are open and the angels are gathered and the judgment begins. At some point, the world will know that it started. The question is, man, and that's what I'll show you tonight. And you can know that if you're safe or not, or are you ready? So tonight, I just want to just uh, bring you back to your elementary school days and begin with a math math lesson. Is that all right? All right. Let's pretend for a moment uh, that this series of that you see on the screen is a, somebody know what this is called, is a number line. It's a number line. And do you remember number lines? Does anybody remember number lines? My wife's a teacher, and, and I know she teaches number lines in sixth grade. And so... I don't know about you, but I knew when I was uh, uh, in elementary school, I had this idea that I would probably never, ever use this in my life. (laughs) But that's not actually true, because I'm using it tonight as an illustration. All right, so all the numbers to the left, as you see here, are negative numbers. And all the numbers to the right are what? Positive numbers. And you see that little line in the middle, it's the gold line right there in the middle, Uh, it represents zero, it represents Zero is the middle of zero. And so let's do a math problem. What is negative 2 plus 3? Negative 2 plus 3. All right, 1. All right, that's a pretty easy problem. Now let's pretend this isn't a number, but it's a date line. And all the numbers to the, to the left of the gold line are the years B.C., before Christ. And all the numbers to the right of the gold line are the years A.D., And so are you with me? All right. Good. So now let's do the same problem. But this time, we're calculating years instead of numbers. If we begin in the year 2 BC and we move three years into the future, where do we land? How many of you answered one? One show of raise a hand. All right. Okay. How many of you say two? All right. How many say, I don't know? (laughs) Uh, If you said one, it's a pretty good answer, except this is with years. And so you have to calculate a little bit differently. The answer is actually two, because there was no zero in years. There's no year zero, correct? There's no year zero. The year 1 BC was immediately followed by the year 1 AD. So you move three years down the line, skipping zero, because it doesn't exist in a timeline. And so you land in 80, 20, 82. And so does that make sense? Does that make sense? Before we go on, this is important. Uh, so you want to remember this. And so when you calculate years, if you cross the BC to 80 line, you add one to the total. And so how much do you add to the total? One. Okay, so one more principle as we get started. In Bible prophecy, the language is symbolic, and quite often a day is used to represent a whole year. We saw that briefly. So, for example, when Jesus tells the church of Smyrna that they're going to suffer 10 days of persecution in Revelation chapter 2, that actually turned out to be how many years? 10 years. Very good. And we saw this, we know this from the emperor Diocletian. Uh, This is a fairly prominent feature that shows up in Bible prophecy, and you find it all over the place. So, for example, when the people of Judah had sinned for 40 years, God told the prophet Ezekiel to show them how long they had been sinning by having him publicly lie on his side for how many days? 40 days. 40 days. And God said, I have laid on you a day for a year. And so, as a result, they were in Managed for 40 years. Does that make sense? All right. A day in Bible prophecy usually represents a year. 
So good, now we have principle number two. And so when you calculate dates and cross the line from B.C. to A.D., always add one to the total. And in Bible prophecy, a day, a day always represents a year. Now we're ready to pick up where we left off from last night. We studied Daniel chapter 8, and we discovered that it's a parallel prophecy to Daniel chapter what? Daniel chapter 2. So we quickly reviewed the Nebuchadnezzar's dream to give ourselves the point. The head of gold was Babylon. The chest of arms and silver represent Persia. The belly and thighs of bronze were Greek. The iron and legs were the were who? The Romans. And the feet of iron and clay was divided room. All right. Let's review. Then we turn to Daniel chapter 8, uh, where we had kind of the same amount of kingdoms, but different symbols. And there was a ram with two uneven horns, which represented the Medes and the Persians. Remember that? We knew that for sure because Gabriel himself even gave us the answer. It represents Persia. So question. I asked, uh, someone asked uh, on the card uh, why in reference to, there was a question, as I said, if you have any questions, I'll take an opportunity. If I can fit it in my message, I'll, I'll answer it there. But someone asked a question, why does the ram push northward? westward and southward does anybody know why because it's coming from the east all right and so that's the reason that's why that's the reason it's actually coming from the east and where is actually the medo persian empire in the east it's in the east so for example uh we know that when daniel is actually in this prophetic uh, in daniel chapter 8 uh, he's actually in the persian kingdom and so we know daniel was one of the wisest men in what persia and so because he's one of the wisest men in Persia, how did the kings from the east, during that Christmas story, knew, know that the Messiah was going to show up at a certain time? Because they got the prophecy from what you're studying today. What you're about to find out today. This is, this is, this is why, so, so this is, you know, we just look at these stories and you know, the Bible, oh, there were three wise men. It doesn't even say it's three wise men. It just says wise men from the east. And so what we begin to see, everything's actually connected. There's a reason. They actually were studying the book of Daniel because Daniel, what happens? If you, if you, are, uh, uh, if you want to be a teacher, you study the best teachers, right? If, if you want to be an apprentice in any type of field, you study the best in that field. And what happens is Daniel, because he knows he, how he, 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 you know, he was a wise man and he was a follower of God, and something happened, and people were following after Daniel, and they saw his prophecies. And as a result, those men from, from the east actually then came to the prophecies and knew Jesus was showing up during a certain time because of the prophecies that we're actually looking at right now. And so the Medo-Persian Empire, they actually came from the east, and when they conquered, they conquered north, northward, they conquered southward, they conquered westward. And so that's uh, why you have... Of that answer. That's to answer that question. As I said, I'll try to do literally an into the message. Then we saw who came next. What came next? What animal? A goat. Okay. And a notable horn, which symbolized who? Alexander the Great in Greece. That horn broke off, and it was replaced by four new horns. And those predicted the four generals who eventually took Alexander's place. And then we saw a little horn, and it was a pretty big subject, so we skimmed over it quickly. But that little horn represents who? The Romans. The Romans. All right. But in their united phase and then in their divided phase. So it kind of covers the same ground as the legs and the feet in the statue. And so we had the ram, we had the goat, we had the little horn. And then there's one more. Does anybody remember what was next? All right, here it was. Daniel 8, 14. And say it with me. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And this is the part of the prophecy was completely different. There were no animals, there were no horns, and there were no conquests. It's just a prediction of time. And so this is the only part of the prophecy where Gabriel didn't really explain it originally. For everything else, Gabriel gave us a lot of detail. The ram is Persia. The goat is Greece. The little horn is the king who, under, and, and who understands all those sinister schemes. He talks about it. And those three parts have lots of explanation. But the 2300 days, Gabriel simply says it's true, it's going to happen, but it happens in many days in the future. 
And then that's it. And remember, Daniel gets upset. He's trying to understand it, and he actually gets sick. He knows it's important, but he can't understand it. So th does that mean that you and I can't understand it? Absolutely not. You and I discovered some important clues. In Daniel 8, 7, we discovered that the vision refers to the time of the end. Understand, son of man, that vision refers to the time of the end. In Daniel 8, 19, we discovered that the 2300-day prophecy is for an appointed time. And then we discovered that Paul describes a last day event that is appointed. He says he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And we saw that that event is the judgment. Are you following me? Yes. So, I want to, your question number one, God has appointed a day on which he will what? Judge the world in righteousness. So fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. He will judge the world in righteousness. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's our question number one. Our number one. Fill in the blank. And so then we look at the prophecy itself. And we saw that the 2300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So we went to the rest of the Bible looking for more information on the cleansing of the sanctuary. Do you remember? Which we realized is an appointed time in which the division refers to. And so again, here we are. In Daniel 8, 17, it says, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to, fill in the blank, the time of the end. And so when... In Earth's history, does this appointed time occur? Number two, the question, answer to the question is the time of the end. So we saw that Daniel's vision recorded in chapter 8 closes with someone asking, how long is the vision? And someone replies, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And so we have three big clues. It's a prophecy about the time of the end. It's a prophecy about a time that's already appointed. And it has something to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. We saw that. And so when you look at all the evidence, the theme of the judgment comes up again. And there is no doubt that God is pointing to the Old Testament sanctuary. We saw that last night. Which proves to be one of the most important keys in unlocking the book of Revelation. There's no question that the language of Daniel 8, the sanctuary language, not only does it mention the sanctuary, it also uses clean animals. It describes the Persians and the Greeks as, as a ram and a goat. And both of these animals were actually used in the sanctuary. And in the other prophecies, you have unclean animals, like a bear shows up and a, and a leopard. But this prophecy are clean animals. It's another piece of evidence pointing us to the sanctuary. Plus, you notice that in Daniel 8 actually talks about sacrifices and mentions the sanctuary sev several times. We saw this. And the last time when we met last night, we went on a tour of the Old Testament sanctuary to see what we would discover. And what did we see? The altar of burnt offering. We saw where sinners bring a sacrificial lamb and confess their sins. And the animal was sacrificed. And of course, that pointed to who? Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed for our sins. We also saw a labor, a large wash basin where priests would have to cleanse themselves before they went inside the tabernacle, into the presence of God. And of course, that represents the cleansing that you and I need before we can step into the presence of God. Amen? And then, then we went inside. We went inside and we saw the sanctuary had two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. In the holy place, there were a seven-branched golden candlesticks, which pointed to Jesus, who's the light of the world. And there was a table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread, which pointed to Jesus, which you know is the bread of life. We saw that. And then the priest was a symbol of Jesus. And who is the great high priest in our heavenly sanctuary? And then we look at the altar of incense. It represented our prayers being mixed with the righteousness of Christ, before they ascended into the presence of God. Then we went into the most holy place. And we found, what do we find there? The Ark of the Covenant. A symbol of God's throne. And this was the place where the presence of God would literally take up residence between the two angels that are known as the cherubim. How do I know that? 
But let's see what the Bible says in Exodus 25, 22. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. This is the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the covenant or testimony, which represents, this represents the very throne in heaven. And so if you study the Bible, stay with me, if you study the Bible, the Bible says Lucifer, the Bible says Lucifer is actually one of those cherubims. It's actually one of those cherubims. In Ezekiel 28, it calls him a covering cherub. And the covering cherub were, were the two angels on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that means at some point, at some time in the distant past, Lucifer actually had one of the most prominent positions in heaven. He was a covering cherub standing right next to the throne room of God. That's why on Friday's message is very important. And then you begin to see the deception that is going on because he counterfeits everything that God does. Because he was in the very presence of, he was the closest to God. And so the sanctuary is one of the most important keys for understanding Revelation. And if you read the book of Revelation very carefully, you'll find sanctuary language all over the place. In Revelation 11, John sees a throne of God in vision. The temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. You see that? In Revelation 1, 13, it said John sees uh, Jesus dressed like a high priest, standing where? In the midst of the seven lampstands. This is in the Bible. See, when I told you now that we have an understanding of the sanctuary, now you're going to start reading Revelation differently when you see these things show up. In Revelation 5, and we saw this on, I believe, uh, one of our nights uh, a couple of days ago. It says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. So we begin to see. Jesus appears in the throne room of heaven. But he doesn't appear as a human being. He's a slain lamb, which is also sanctuary language. Revelation 8. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. See that? At the altar. That he given much incense. He should offer it with prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So, now that's uh, not the altar of sacrifice, of course. That's our, the altar of sacrifice is in the courtyard. This is the altar of incense, right up against the curtain. And the smoke from the altar rises in the presence of God's throne, which is on the other side of the curtain. And so it might be in the holy place, but its primary function has to do with the most holy places. So this is why when we pray, it's important your prayers actually enter the very throne room of God. That's good news. When you're praying, your God hears your prayers. And so, Revelation 14 describes the second coming with the sanctuary language. Look what it says. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come. Where did the angel come from? The temple. The temple. All right, the temple in heaven. And so, he says, continues, for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now remember, a lot of the feasts in Israel, what we looked at, had to do with harvest time, like the feast of the first fruits. And that's the reason you find the second coming described in the language of harvest so often. In the first Corinthians 15, Paul says Christ is the first fruit of then that rest of becoming the first part of the harvest. It's all sanctuary language. It's all sanctuary language. And so then another angel continued, came from up the temple from which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. Where did it come from? The temple which is in heaven. And he cried with a loud cry. To him who's had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So when it's time for the second coming, they make an announcement in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary. 
This is one of the biggest keys to the book of Revelation. And I can't emphasize this enough. There is a sanctuary in heaven. The earthly sanctuary, the one that humans built, it was a pattern after the real sanctuary that God built in heaven. We saw that last night. And we saw, we saw what God was doing. And the sanctuary is not just limited to the book of Revelation. It comes up also in Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah saw it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the what? The temple. Where was God's throne? In the temple, in heaven. So, this is easily one of the most dominant themes in the Bible. And now, last night, we studied the sanctuary and its furniture, but we also looked at the seven festivals that happened every year. There were seven special feasts held every year. There was the feast that showed us the complete work of Jesus for the church. The whole year proved to be a prophecy of ministry, Jesus' ministry, until the day they died and until he came again, comes again. And so you had the Passover where the lamb was slain and the blood was smeared on the doorposts of the house in order to prevent the angel of death from visiting. That was predicted at the cross where the lamb of God died to save us from the wages of sin. Then you had the feast of unleavened bread where all the leaven was removed from your house and that symbolized the removal of sin from our lives. Then on the third day, the priest would wave a sheaf of grain and act as act as faith, as this is a harvest, it will come, and it pointed to the third day when Jesus rose from the dead, becoming the first fruits of them who slept. And it was also a guarantee, it was a guarantee that you and I also will rise from the dead at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so you had the feast of Pentecost, which pointed to the day when Jesus launched his New Testament church on the very day of Pentecost. Then you had a long break over the summer, which kind of synced with the dark ages. And then when fall came, you had this three months feast. And here we go. The Feast of Trumpets, which was a solemn warning that you had 10 days to make it right with God. Because the next feast was the what? The Day of Atonement. The solemn day of judgment. And if you didn't make things right by then, you were cast out of the camp of Israel forever. And the last feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. When the people of Israel would go camping in little booths made of branches, and it was a celebration of the fact that their time in the wilderness was over, and they were now in the promised land. And they were celebrating the fact that God had kept his promise to bring them home. And of course, that points to the second coming of Jesus Christ, that God will literally tabernacle with us, with his people, and we'll finally go home. And that's what we studied last night. But then we slowed down and we examined the Day of Atonement. Some people call it Yom Kippur. Ten days earlier, they blew the trumpets as a warning. You have ten days to make things right. The Bible says that everybody was supposed to search their hearts. Leviticus 23, 30 to 29 says, For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And everything... Absolutely everything had to be right or you will be removed from God's presence forever. This was the final chance. And during the Day of Atonement, they had a special ritual to cleanse the temple. A ceremony you find in Leviticus 16, 33. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tabernacle meeting. So why would the sanctuary need atonement? Why would the sanctuary need atonement? It's people who need atonement, not buildings. Wouldn't you agree? Except that all year long, the sins of Israel were symbolically transferred into the sanctuary. You would confess your sins over that sacrificial lamb. Then the lamb would die in your place and the blood was carried to the tabernacle. Someone ought to say, you remember, who's worthy? Who's the blood? Who's worthy? Who's worthy? The blood of Jesus. One way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. This is what it represents, Jesus Christ. It was a symbolic of Jesus taking your sins on himself. But that meant it was done only symbolically. All that sin was in the sanctuary in the presence of God. So once a year, they cleansed the sanctuary. It was the most solemn day of the year, and two goats were chosen. One was called the Lord's goat, 
and it was sacrificed, and the blood was carried into the sanctuary. And that was a symbol, one was, one was a symbol of Jesus. And the high priest, who was also a symbol of Jesus, went alone into the most holy place, carrying that blood, and he sprinkled it on the lid of the ark, which is called the mercy seat. And this was the very solemn occasion. If everything wasn't exactly right, he would drop dead in the presence of God. The Day of Atonement is also mentioned in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 9, 7, But into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins. So you see, the high priest went into the second compartment, the most holy place, by himself just once a year, and he offered blood in his presence. He did that on Yom Kippur, the day of judgment, and he did it every year, every year, until suddenly, at the death of Christ, an unseen hand suddenly ripped the veil in two, exposing the most holy place. It was the moment when all those rituals in the temple were suddenly finished. Why? Because the real Lamb of God just came and he died on the cross. And there we go. And this is why. What happened? In the earthly sanctuary when Jesus died on the cross, Matthew 27, 51, what does it say? The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You know that story. That's what happened. And for the first time, everybody was able to see into the holy places. It was a moment when all the rituals were all finished. And so, why? Because the real Lamb of God had died in the courtyard. And he was going back to heaven's sanctuary as our great high priest. And when Jesus died, we no longer needed the earthly sanctuary. That's why we don't kill lambs today. We no longer needed the symbol because he is the real thing. And so now the Lamb of God is also our high priest in the real sanctuary, the one in heaven. So, for my question to you, question number four. After his death and resurrection, I want to ask a question. Where did Jesus go? After his death and resurrection, where did Jesus go? All right, let's see what the Bible says. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with Hands, which are what? Copies of the true. But where did he go? Into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. We have the real lamb and the real sanctuary. Now let's go back to the prophecy. On earth, as a man, Jesus fulfilled his rule as a sacrifice for us. After his death and resurrection, he entered the sanctuary in heaven to serve as our high priest. Quick recap, as you're filling your study guide, very quick, in 5, 6, and 7. What happened once each year in the earthly sanctuary on the Day of Atonement? The high priest took blood and went into the holy place and made atonement. All right, that's what happened. That's question number 5. The high priest went into the holy place and made atonement. Just a quick recap so we understand what's going on. All right, next question, number 6. In Daniel's vision, what was to take place at the end of the 2300 days? The cleansing of the sanctuary. We saw that. The cleansing of the sanctuary. And then, for number seven, in Bible prophecy, how much literal time does a day symbolize? A year. All right, so we got it. You got the references. This is important as we go on, as we continue. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And let me ask you, when was the sanctuary cleansed? On you. All right. And we know that day, known, that day is known as, in reference to the festival, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, or the Day of Judgment. So what is Daniel telling us? This is absolutely amazing. Gabriel didn't explain this, Dan, this, this to Daniel in chapter 11. But in Daniel chapter 9, he comes back. That's why you always read the whole thing. And look what he says in Daniel 9. Gabriel, 
whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. See, Daniel chapter 9 opens with Daniel praying for understanding. And while he's praying, he suddenly gets a visitor, the angel Gabriel. The same angel who visited him at the beginning of this story. Gabriel. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. Aren't you so glad God doesn't leave us hanging? In other words, Gabriel is saying, Daniel, I know you didn't get it the first time, so now I'm going to explain it to you. And for the rest of this chapter, Daniel, Gabriel explains it by giving Daniel something known as the 70-week prophecy. Are you ready? The 70-week prophecy. Now, before we look at that, let's review those two principles again. If you're calculating dates and you go from B.C. to A.D., how do you add the total? You add how many? One. And how many days would be in a week? How many days would be in a week if a day in Bible prophecy actually represents a year? Seven days. Okay, so a week in Bible prophecy would actually be seven years. Does that make sense? All right. So now we're moving. We're going to move very carefully because we're about to uncover some very important material and we're going to let the Bible speak for itself. Because the 70-week prophecy is something a lot of people talk about. But most people take out of context. And that's why it's so much confusion, even in Christendom today. So, let me read this verse. Daniel 9, 24. What does it say? 70 weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city. Let me ask you. Who are Daniel's people? Jews. Jews. And which city would be Daniel's city? Jerusalem. What Gabriel is saying is very important. Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people. The original word, the original word here means set aside or to cut off something. And so it's cutting off 70 weeks from the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. The vision from the beginning that Daniel was trying to understand. And Daniel, 70 weeks are cut off from the prophecy for your people and for your city. So let me ask you, how many days in a week? Seven. And a day represents how much? A year. So this is 70 weeks, which then is 490 days. And a day in Bible prophecy equals a year. So we're actually talking about what? 490 years. All right? This is why this is important. This is important. Daniel 9 does not stand alone. Gabriel is taking 70 weeks or 490 years out of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. So let's put this chart together for you so you understand what is taking place. You have the 2,300-day year prophecy. And we begin to see this is what happens. And Daniel 9 is talking about the 490 days, which is 490 years. Those first 490 days are cut from the longer prophecy, and they're set aside for whose people? Daniel's people. So this is a prophecy regarding specifically Daniel's people who were the Jews who lived in Jerusalem. It's a prophecy about the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And what we don't know is when the prophecy starts. But Gabriel is about to explain that. And this is what Gabriel says in Daniel 9.25. Know therefore, so now he gives them the start of the prophecy. The start of the prophecy, so you can understand what's going on today. Now, therefore, know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build, where? Jerusalem, unto the Messiah, the Prince. Now, real quick, what event marks the beginning of the 2300-day prophecy, year prophecy? What event? Number eight. The decree or the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. All right. So that's number eight. When Daniel received the vision, this is important to understand in the context. Jerusalem was in ruins. The Babylonians, remember, had destroyed it and taken God's people captive. Gabriel tells Daniel a command will be issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And that this command will mark the beginning 
of the 2300-day prophecy. Do you get it? Yes. All right. See, we know the Persian ruler Artaxerxes issued this command. History lets us know. He, he issued this command in 457 B.C. 457 B.C. So it begins to something. Daniel, it continues, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks and the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And so Daniel, after 69 weeks, it says the Messiah will come. After how many weeks the Messiah will come? 69 weeks. That's seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69 weeks. And when does that begin? When does the decree again for Jerusalem, that decree to rebuild Jerusalem go out? We saw it in 457 B.C. 457 B.C. under Artaxerxes. And you can read about this whole decree in Ezra chapter 7 for your own study. So we begin to see what's happening. So 457 B.C. Now that's what we know for now. Gabriel said that it will be 69 weeks until the Messiah, which is 483 years. Remember, a day is for a year, correct? And of course, you add one to the total when you cross B.C. to the 80. So that takes us to what year? It takes us to 27 A.D. Now, 27 A.D. happens to be the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And does anybody know what happens in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar? The baptism of Jesus. And according to Luke 3, according to Luke chapter 3, that happened the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And on that occasion, the heavens opened and God announced the beginning of his son's ministry. You remember the scene? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, because this is the prophecy. And have you wondered why Jesus spent so many years in obscurity? Why? Because Daniel 9 lets us know it was supposed to be, he was supposed to come on at a specific time. And so we have 69 weeks until the Messiah makes his public appearance. But the whole prophecy is 70 weeks, which takes us down to 34 A.D., And does anybody know what happened in that year? Did anybody know what happened in the year 34 AD? Stephen was stoned. Stephen, he was a deacon. He makes his last appeal to the nation of Israel. One last appeal to accept the Messiah. And he reviews the whole history of Israel. And they reject it. And they stone him to death. Who was the prophecy for? The prophecy was for Daniel's people and Jerusalem. And that was the beginning of the great persecution, spearheaded by none other than the apostle Paul, who later became, he was Saul, but who later became Paul. And the Bible says that persecution scattered the believers, which means that the gospel is suddenly carried to all over the place. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. And in the words of Jesus, in Matthew 21, the vineyard is rented out to someone else. He says the kingdom of God will be given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And in AD 34, the 70 weeks is over. The special period of time set aside for Daniel's people is finished. And the gospel then goes to the Gentiles. And according to the Bible, that means everybody can now be an Israelite. You can be an Israelite. And Paul actually writes, and he says this in Galatians 3.29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And as a result, you are heirs to the promise. And you know what I love about this? That means because every promise that I look at the Old Testament Bible, because I'm an heir of Christ, I can claim the promises because I'm Israel today. That's good news. You and I are descendants of Abraham, even if we don't have a drop of Jewish blood. That's why Paul could even say in Romans 2, 28 to 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Now, I want to be clear that the people of Israel will always have a special place in God's heart. But the sharp distinction between Jew and Gentile is now gone. It's gone. And honestly, it was always supposed to be that way. The Bible teaches that Israel was supposed to be the light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to bring the Gentiles into a covenant family. And now under the New Testament, that's exactly what God does. 
And you and I have been grafted in. In Romans 10, 12, it says, For there is diff- no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord over is rich unto all that call upon him. The distinction is gone. The time was up. There were 70 weeks or 490 years for Daniel's people. Stephen is put to death and the gospel goes to the rest of the world. And so that happens in 34 AD. And so now we've got the decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC. We've got the baptism of Jesus, the appearance of the Messiah right on schedule in 27 AD. And the close time as a set in Daniel's prophecy. And that would be amazing enough, but family, there is more. In Daniel 9, 26, it says, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And for the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So I want to ask another question. At some point after 62 weeks, which are part of the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off from other people. So when was the Messiah cut off? Does anybody know when the Messiah would have been cut off? All right, very good. That is that. And that did happen after his baptism. Then Gabriel says that someone would come and destroy the temple. And again, of course, that happened too. When did that happen? In AD 70. When a Roman general named Titus marched into Jerusalem and absolutely destroyed the temple. So you've got the death of Christ and the sack of Jerusalem. So let's put that on the chart. At some point after his baptism, Jesus dies on the cross. And we know that happens before the stoning of Stephen. So we'll put it there after the 69 weeks. That is very specific, but it gets even more specific. Let me ask you, how, many time, how much time elapses between 27 AD and 34 AD? Seven. seven. It's seven years. In prophecy, it's one week, the 70th week. Now listen to this. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But what happens? In the, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So let me ask you, who put an end to the sacrificial system? It was Jesus. This is very important. And many of you may not understand this, but this is very important because they, they this is why we talk, they no, needed, no longer needed a sacrifice because the real lamb of God came and he had given his life on the cross. So the hand of God rips the veil as we saw in two. And so we begin to see that this text is clearly a prophecy of Jesus. And yet, if you read some modern books, that's why this is important. If you read some modern books, they try to say that this is a prophecy of the Antichrist. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. This is a confusion. I'm telling you, in most of the Christian world. But, but read the ninth chapter of Daniel very carefully, and it's obviously he's talking about the Messiah, the Prince. He says the Messiah is cut off for other people. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, not Antichrist. And it's only in the past 150 years or so that anybody has tried to make this about something other than Jesus. This is clearly about the Messiah. And it says that in the middle of the week, the Messiah brings an end to sacrifices, which is exactly what Jesus did. So let's put it on the chart. The middle of the week will be the spring of AD 31. When Jesus died on the cross in Calvary, he brings the sacrifices to an end and the veil in the temple is torn in two. And it happened right on time. There can be no doubt that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. More than 500 years in advance, Daniel saw it and he even gave us dates. There is no question that the Bible is not a human document. It is inspired by God. Now, let me show you. Let me address something for a moment. In recent years, some people have taken the last week of the prophecy, as I stated, 70 weeks, and they've removed it from the rest of the prophecy and put it down to the end of time. That's what's happening. They say that it represents the final seven years of Earth's history. You've heard this before. You've heard of the secret rapture. 
There is absolutely nothing in the Bible to suggest this. So let me ask you, does this make sense? Does the 70th week come after the 69th week? Or, or does it come at some random time in the distant future? Let, let's just think about this logically. Let's say that we are vacationing together. We, you are, or we went on a vacation. We went on a vacation. And we're going to the United States. And you want to pay me a visit. And you let me know that your hotel is 70 miles from where I'm staying. And so you allow yourself about an hour to get there. And, but after four hours, you still haven't found the right exit or freeway. So you call me. And you say, I thought you said that it was 70 miles away. And then what did I say? I said, well, but what I forgot to tell you is that it's 2,000 2, miles between the 69th mile and the 70th mile. <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely not. So why is the majority of Christendom think that is so? The 70th week comes right after the 69th week. So let's look at it. You've got the 70 weeks for Daniel's people. And we know it ends in 34 AD. You've got 69 weeks, you see it, until the Messiah, the Prince, and Jesus is baptized in 27 AD. It says that the Messiah brings an end to sacrifices in the middle of the week. And he cuts off in 31 AD, right on schedule. It's absolutely breathtaking. And Gabriel says that this prophecy, the 70 weeks, is lifted out of the what prophecy? The 2,300-day prophecy. And so he just solved the puzzle. The 2,300 years also begins in 457 B.C., and if you remember to add one across the B.C. to the 80 line, it ends in what year? 1844. After the Dark Ages. And do you realize what this means? The spring festival is pointed to the earthly ministry of Jesus. And after a long break, the fall festival is pointed to the end of time. And after 2,300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. It's not the second coming of Christ, but it is the beginning of the time of the end. It is the heavenly Yom Kippur, the hour of judgment. That means that the books are already open. And the scene from Daniel 7 is already taking place. In Daniel 7, 9 to 10, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair, head, his, and, and, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. And so, study guide number nine, question number nine. How does the Bible describe the solemn scene as judgment? How does the Bible describe the solemn scene as judgment begins in the heavenly sanctuary? It says the judgment was set. And, the, and what was open? The books were open. So how does the Bible describe the solemn scene as judgment begins in the heavenly sanctuary? The judgment was set and the books were open. And there we go. I beheld the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as, white as snow and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. And here's your answer. The judgment was set. And the books were open. That's how the Bible describes the scene. The Bible clearly teaches us that some point before Jesus comes back, a type of judgment begins. This could be scary if we don't understand the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. But Romans 14.10 says, for we all shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And if you go to verse 22, he, he gives the verdict of the trial. And this is why, family, the gospel is important and why it is good news for those who have responded to the call of Jesus and live in Jesus. 
In Daniel 7, 22, listen to what it says. So we come, let's see it. Let's look at it one more time. Daniel 7, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. He's moving to a different compartment. A fiery stream issue came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set in 1844, and the books opened in 1844. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment, here we go, a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. You see, who wins the case in the judgment? All those who believe in Jesus. You see, the prosecutor is, which is Satan, but we have a defense lawyer, which is Christ. And Christ wins the case because the text says that judgment was made in favor of the saints. And so it's not nothing to be afraid of. It's made in favor of the saints. So many people get afraid of the judgment. But if you're in Jesus, it is made in favor of you. Since 1844. What happened? After the verdict. What happened after the verdict? After that time of judgment, once the verdict is made, once Jesus defends the believers through this investigative judgment, once he proves legally that, that he has a right to take believers to heaven, not because of our own righteousness, but because of the faith that we have in him, which then as a result produces works, not because of good works, then and only then can he take us to heaven. It says, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And so this is happening. Since 1844, a judgment is taking place. Since 1844, the books are open. The books are open. Who is really mine? Who are the saints? Because all the saints will be judged. They'll be in favor of you. And so, number 10, number 10, should we fear the judgment? That's a question I want to ask. Should we fear the judgment? Who stands up for us in the judgment to make sure our names remain in the Graham's Book of Life? And who is our advocate or our lawyer in the judgment? Jesus. It should be good news. You see, 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The judgment message is good news for the saints. That's why there's a call right now since 1844, a specific message. And I, I say that due to what God is doing right now, back in Samuel 7, 9 to 10, the Bible clearly teaches us that at some point before Jesus comes, the judgment begins. And when the judgment is over, when the judgment is over, Jesus receives a kingdom. And the next event in Daniel 7 is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The moment is coming when the stone will smash the statue, and the kingdoms of man will pass away forever. The moment is coming when Jesus will establish his kingdom, one that lasts forever, and he does it at the moment the judgment is finished. And do you realize what this means? We're just about there, family. The history of this planet is just about finished. The judgment hour 
is on the way. And when it is finished, it's over. And when Jesus comes, the decision are made. Look what it says in Revelation 22, 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is what? Is with me. To give to every man according as his work shall be. And when Jesus comes, the decision is made. So let me ask. How can Jesus give out rewards when he comes? It's because judgment is already finished. It happens just before he returns. And at some point, the world will know that the judgment hour has begun. And this text I'm about to share with you is the message that God has given to a movement of destiny and what you are hearing today. In Revelation 14, 6 and 7. It says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. It's really true. There really is a time of the end, and you and I are already there. And that means the kingdom of God and Christ is right around the corner. So let me ask you this. Just about everything the Bible has predicted has already happened. We are just a heartbeat away from the second coming. Jesus came for the first time exactly the way the Bible said, the, and right on time. There were literally thousands, dozens of prophecies designed to let us know when Jesus would come. And the sanctuary showed us this in detail. And now, and now it says he's coming again. And it's not going to be wrong about that, that either. And God is not going to let human suffer, suffering last forever. So my question to you is, where are you with Jesus? Because at some point, very soon, the books are going to close. And that's why we know what's happening in heaven. We begin to see what's happening, some things happening down here on earth. Someday soon, the books are going to close. That's going to be it. But right now, the hour of his judgment has come. Since 1844, the books have been opened. And so the question is, where are you with Jesus right now? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He says he received this gift. It's free. Tonight, if you stand with Jesus, if you choose him to represent you in the judgment, if you choose to believe that the cross covers your sins and you want to be ready for Jesus to come and you want to make a decision today, I ask that you stand. You want to confirm or you want to make a decision for Jesus today, now's the time to run away from the enemy and run to God. He loves you. And you know that time is running out. He is a God of love and he has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. We say thank you for a wonderful Savior. I want to show you this text in 1 John 4 16 to 18. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. What is God? Is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. The love God has for us sinners, even his enemies. Notice it does not say that, that one of God's attributes is love. It says that God is actually is love. And you want to know what love is? You have to go to God. And everything that he does, including the judgment, is love. And this is love. When, when you understand all that God has done for us, you will have boldness in the day of judgment. Look what John 1, 1 John 1, 4, 16 to 18 says. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have what? Boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. 
Why would sinners have boldness in the day of judgment? Because God looks at Christians, born again, baptized persons, as if they are his son. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is good news. The judgment is good news. Who's afraid of the judgment? Christ's sacrifice on the cross was demonstrated by God's love. God's love for us. He loves us more than himself. He went to the cross so you can live with him. Never doubt the love of God, family. If you're afraid of the judgment, you do not understand the love of God. Jesus will never let you down. He will save you to the uttermost. For he is the high priest right now interceding for us. We don't have to fear. Yes, we may suffer a few things here on this earth. But oh, what a day of rejoicing it's going to be when we get to heaven. And so, tonight, I don't know if there's anybody here tonight. But I want to give you another opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may be listening and watching by way of online. You recognize that you are actually now living in the judgment hour. The books are open. But one day the books are going to close. And the signs of the times are telling us that something is actually going on in heaven. Jesus is about to come. He's about to close those books. The time of mercy will soon come to an end. But he promised, he says, I don't want anybody to perish. And that's why the gospel is going forward so that everyone, man, woman, boy or girl, has an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ, to confess their sins. For he is faithful and just to forgive us of their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. So that those sins enter into the sanctuary. So that your sins will be cleansed on the day of judgment. So if you're here tonight... I'm going to ask you to receive the card. You can fill that card out or you can let me know and you can place those in the buckets as you leave here tonight. But if you're listening by way of online, you have an opportunity even on that website there to make a decision. You can sign there at Signs of the Times, bda.org, and you can say, I want to submit, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. You want to take that opportunity to recognize, you know what, I've been messing with time. My time is about to come to an end. And there's a God who loves you more than you can comprehend. And he says, come to me exactly how you are. And let him do the change that he desires and promise that he will do in you. He said, he who begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. There is absolutely nothing you can do where you can save yourself. But there's a love in God that sent his son. That whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so are you here tonight? Would you make that decision and commit your life to Jesus? I invite you to fill it out. And I want to pray with you at this time. Father God, we thank you for the good news even of the judgment. Father, thank you for teaching us today, Lord God, so that we can understand clearly what time it is in earth's history. And since 1844, Lord God, the books have been opened. A little later, we'll talk about even what happened during that time period, even in the world, Lord God, but but we thank you for allowing us to know that your prophecies are right on time. And so, God, I pray for that individual that is still struggling with a decision. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit gives him peace and rest and let him know that you love him. You love her, that you promised, Lord God, that you would never leave them nor forsake him. You are their hope, Lord God. You are their advocate and you are their judge. I pray, Father, that as men, women, boy, and girl, Lord God, make their relationship, Lord God, and their, uh, Lord God, salvate their, their relationship with you secure as a result of your blood, that you would give them peace even during this judgment hour. And so, God, we thank you. We thank you for the good news of the judgment. We thank you that you are coming soon. We thank you for even giving us these signs of the times so that we will know exactly what to do. 
Let your name be glorified. And God, as we leave this place, never your presence. We pray, Lord God, as we transition and you bring us all back on Friday. And Lord God, you will protect every single one here today. That the messages that they've heard over the last couple of days, oh God, you would allow, Lord God, to marinate upon their hearts. And then they can study to see if these things are so. And so, God, thank you for coming upon their minds and their hearts so that they can know you even more. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God say amen. 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 So do you know what time it is? It's Judgment Day. I'll see you tomorrow on Friday night, everyone. Our message will be the anatomy of evil. God bless you. Have a good night. We'll see you on Friday night. She